What's going on, Mowatu family? And welcome back. Today's lesson, we're doing open root pipe tutorial on aluminum on a 6G position. We got Travis here, Travis Field. He's gonna show us the introduction to aluminum, and we're using 6061 aluminum pipe and 4043 uh, filler wire for aluminum. So, Travis, welcome back again. Thank you. It was just pretty much yesterday that we saw you, so I don't know why you're saying welcome back. Anyways. I've been uh, here the whole week. He's been here the whole we're, week. We were golfing, we were doing everything. Everything's Going for dinners. <laughs> uh, again, I'm Amar Gilo, I'm the welding supervisor. This is Abraham Quintanilla. He is a lead instructor, and Travis Field again. Um, aluminum pipe. Tell us, Travis, what do we got here on the board and what do we need to know? Well, well essentially, this is uh, just uh, ideas of aluminum. Uh, basically, aluminum is a very difficult metal. It, uh, it forms oxide very rapidly, but it's a very difficult metal to weld. And there's a lot of variables that a person has to follow uh, and remember while welding this. Uh, but we'll start off, basically, the basically aluminum has an oxide uh, layer that melts about 3,700 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you brush this oxide off, the material underneath the oxide melts at 1220. Now, basically when it comes to brushing, uh, you brush all these in one direction, whether it's downward stroke or upward stroke. And I know at uh, the training facility that I spend a lot of time at, Jerry B College of Welding, uh, Jerry actually has an arrow, upward arrow, that you brush always in one direction. The reason being for this is because you, you, you remove the oxide with one, one uh, stroke in one direction, but if you go backwards, it, it uh, digs into the uh, soft aluminum and it uh, embeds the oxide into, into it a lot deeper. Okay. But basically when it comes to aluminum, there's, there's two different uh, um, uh, fit-ups that I've been taught, I've been shown at uh, the uh, trade facility there. Um, there's extended land fit-up and there's a, a open root uh, butt joint here. And with the extended land fit up, essentially the way it is, is you have a 332 land uh, and 332 extended land. They'll be butt up tight and you don't have to use a backing purge unless for critical applications, but you can slam it up tight. Uh, usually if you wear a shade 11 lens, it helps with uh, uh, seeing, removing the gloss and glare of the uh, weld puddle. But if you use a shade 11 lens, you can uh, give a surge of current. It'll, it'll remove a lot of the cleaning action. You'll see the weld puddle. Uh, it'll start, uh, it'll melt the seam in the middle of the weld puddle and, and it'll form a weld puddle. And then you'll see it go slightly concave. When it goes concave, you can just dab into the, uh, the weld puddle there. And then you'll see it kind of grow. And then you move to a leading edge and then repeat the process all over again. Okay, so for this extended land, um, it's critical for it to be a 332 land. Anything more than that, it's going to be some hard penetration. It's going to get. It's going to be hard to get the penetration inside that, the root. If anything bigger than a 332. That's true. Okay. Yeah. You get away with a 116. Oh, you can. Uh, smaller size pipe. Okay. Yeah. Small diameter. Pipe. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Trent. Also, the uh, uh, butt weld. Uh, we'll have a, a normal, typical butt weld. Uh, we'll have. A, a, I'll be using a 1/8 gap in the video and a 1/8 filler metal and I'll have the filler metal on the outside of the pipe, so I'll be dabbing in the outside of the pipe there, and the root pass will be going in via capillary action, but that will be purged, uh, that particular pipe. Also in the video, I'll be using a 2% uh, uh, lanthanated with a sharp point, so the, the arc is a lot more focused when I do the root pass, when I switch to the, uh, pardon? Can you back feed it? Oh no, um, uh, aluminum is very, um, aluminum in general is very difficult to weld, but. Uh, I have found uh, in, in practice, uh, uh, while trying different welding techniques, I have found that uh, when trying to backfeed uh, the arc, the electricity seems to uh, 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 know where the filler metal is. And even if I'm on the leading edge, uh, the arc will heat up the filler metal and they'll start, uh, it's like an arc, the filler metal arcs out to various parts on the, uh, on the, uh, on the material. No, I understand that, yeah. So, nope. Yeah, the we're, we're at the tungsten part, so it has to be sharp at first, so we can make that, once you start creating that arc, it's going to make that dull, that, that perfect dullness where it needs to run that open root. Well, it, it depends on, um, um, like a lot of applications, uh, aerospace, uh, automotive, uh, NASCAR, uh, it, it very depends on, on, uh, on the tungsten prep and also the kind of tungsten. I believe there's a, a manifold manufacturer on, on YouTube that has videos where he's tried different tungstens and he's had uh, different uh, etching okay. um, and he's had uh, uh, different weld results with a different tungsten and how they hold up at elevated, elevated temperatures. I've also found that 2% uh, thorated seems a crack in the middle when you have it at elevated temperatures. Mm, yeah. um, another thing, Travis, so when we run the root pass, you recommend 2% lanthanide, correct? Uh, it, well, it, it doesn't necessarily matter which, uh, okay. which tungsten is, is used, but okay. the only, it's only a per personal preference. preference. Okay. Yeah, okay. and the reason I'm using a 2% uh, thorated 
uh, or it's because it's not balling up as uh, readily and as freely as a okay. pier. Okay. And so it, uh, because it's, it's a, a sharp point, I'm able to more, more so focus on, um, on the bevel tips themselves. Uh, 2% lanthanated? Yeah, 2 that's, lanthanated. that's what will be welding in the video, is 2% lanthanated. Okay. Um, so if you're going to run the hot pass filling cap, would you still use 2% lanthanated or would you switch to pure? Uh, essentially because I do not need the, uh, uh, the penetration characteristics of, of what I, I would get away on the root pass, I'll switch over to a, a, a pure, okay. uh, um, yes, a, a, a green pure. And the reason being is because with the ball here, it has a, a wide cleaning action. Okay. It's a bigger surface tension, yeah, and a shallower penetration. So I'll be able to clean more exactly. and really get in there. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, routine. What what is the routine for aluminum? First well, things first. Well, essentially, uh, when it comes to different metals, you have to think in. Uh, it's almost like neuro linguistics programming, where you find similarities in, in different uh, aspects of metal. Even though this is aluminum welding, we're, we'll be doing. Uh, you also have to think about uh, in in relation to nickel or yeah, nickel alloys, chrome, is that uh, uh, basically you're always heating up, and you, there's always a, a routine that you have to follow in order to be successful in this particular metal. Uh, this metal right here, what I'll be doing is I'll be heating it up, but I'll be heating it up to 250 Fahrenheit for the root pass. Uh, heating it up uh, helps the weld puddle wash out a lot better. It helps it uh, um, clean etching, remove oxides a lot better. Uh, it helps the weld puddle break down the parent material or the previous pass. Okay. Uh, and also it, it allows for travel distance um, so that uh, I'm not traveling so slowly with the weld puddle trying to break down the, the parent material where it starts to form oxides. Okay, okay. Uh, are, you gonna, are you gonna keep it under a certain temperature? Um, keep it under 600 to 700. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna keep it under that, okay. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's recommended crucially for you, um, your personal preference, to preheat this aluminum pipe? Uh, with, within reason. Within it it, reason. De it okay. depends on the thickness, uh, it depends on the application, but okay. something this thick. Uh, and I do know that helium will, will turn a 200 amp machine into a 300 amp machine and help with the penetration characteristics. And, okay. um, but uh, for personal preference, I find that it, it just helps with, with uh, breaking down the parent material. Uh, and it helps with washing out if it's if it's preheated. Okay. Okay. Sweet. 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 Um, so uh, brush up oxides, like you said, um, pure tungsten, you know, for the hot pass fill and cap, yeah. and two percent lanthanated for the root pass. Yeah. Uh, personal preference for for you, which you recommend for everybody else as well. Uh, within reason. Within it's, reason. Yeah. Within reason. Because a lot of this is all personal. It's just personal preference, and uh, uh, many welders use different. They may use pure the whole way through. They may use uh, a completely different uh, um, zirconium or zirconiated uh, tungsten. They may use something completely different. Uh, uh, aluminum is a very wide range. It's a very, very common metal in a lot of places. Okay. Um, so they may use different, depending on personal preference. Okay, so now, anybody that's pretty much thinking, um, can I use a wire wheel for that? Uh, can I use any mechanical tools uh, for that? I, as far as you know, a grinder or anything like that to prep it up easier for me. That's what they're probably thinking. If anybody hasn't welded aluminum before, probably know. Well, I could just probably wire wheel it or something. What do you? What do you? Would you what would you tell them? Uh, when it comes to uh, aluminum welding, uh, this is one of the very first things. This is one of the reasons why I spend a lot of time at a place called GRB College of Welding, and I take a lot of uh, Jerry's courses there. Is that um, uh, when I was learning how to weld, and I've, I've, uh, Jerry at GRB has always seen me from. The very beginning, learning how to weld 6010 roots, 718 filling caps, to learning all the various different metals, carbon, chrome, nickel alloys, pipeline, etc. But um, the one thing to understand is that every individual metal, you, you almost have to think of yourself as a, as a psychologist, and every uh, metal has its own personality, personal quirk, yep. and you have to uh, interact with the metal and you have to treat it very differently. But when it, when it comes to a, a tool, tooling and applications, you've got to use a, a cold means, anything that will not uh, create uh, friction. Friction creates heat. Uh, uh, the atmosphere now starts to oxidize the material and it starts to uh, embed oxides into the material. So essentially, you'll be using uh, well, woodworking tools. Uh, this is actually something that I, when I was at GRB, Jerry had given me a, a, a wood router, uh, a stainless steel hand brush. There was no emery cloth because on other materials you would use emery cloth to clean the filler metal. You'd use emery cloth on the material internally and externally, but aluminum because it's very soft, uh, emery cloth sandpaper embeds the particles into the material here and they'll start to come out while you're welding. So you have to be very conscientious of what materials you're using, including uh, uh, grinding discs that are made for aluminum. Uh, those still create a lot of friction, create a lot of heat, and create a lot of oxides. So if you're doing pipe welding, do not use uh, uh, grind discs that are made for aluminum. Use woodworking tools, wood router, and also 
when it uh, when I was first learning how to do this in the course there, uh, I had the prep. I had to do my own uh, prep work. Uh, and Jerry gave me a wood router, and he gave me a, a wood router bit with a tiny little wheel in there. And you'd have the wood router, and you'd place it on here, and the wheel would kind of ride around the pipe. And basically, like you have aluminum aluminum flakes flying everywhere. It's like woodworking. It's like just yeah. woodworking all over. It, it, it basically the the uh, welding booth looked like a snow globe. Oh, essentially, wow. is yeah, it was all over the place. I even said to Jerry, it's like a snow globe in here. <laughs> it's but, insane, brother. But uh, when it comes to this material, uh, uh, generally woodworking tools, you will not use a, 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 a bit um, carbide. Yeah, you'll, you'll not use a carbide bit because uh, because of speed and everything, uh, it, it gums up the bit. Okay. Uh, even a file you'll find will be gummed up. Uh, and also on the stainless steel brush, a lot of the oxides will go onto the stainless steel brush. Um, but you'll be using woodworking tools, wood router, uh, wood chisels, and um, wood routers, bits, etc. Okay. Okay. Sweet, sweet, sweet. So now, uh, when it comes to um, aluminum, uh, the settings in the machine, um, you're running AC or DC. Let these, these these people know, especially because, like I said, it's an introduction to aluminum. Even though we're doing an open root yeah. pipe. Um, the machine, we're using a Miller Dynasty 350. Yep. What's a recommended machine for aluminum? Uh, essentially, as long as you have a machine that is uh, AC, uh, AC capable, uh, which has the negative for the, the welding uh, uh, characteristics and the positive for the cleaning action. Um, Essentially, has doesn't matter relatively what machine you can still do the welding as long as it's AC uh, to do the welding. Uh, different Hertz. Uh, I'll be running um, probably about 120 to 160 uh, for the uh, frequency. I'll be Hertz maybe about uh, 65, which is the balance of the positive and the negative uh, on the. Uh, um, on the Miller Dynasty 350, we can independently change the electrode uh, and or the positive side and the negative side, which is uh, the cleaning action and the and the welding action. We can also change different waveforms in the secret menu. You just hit the average button and the dig button, and it can change through all the all the settings and change the waveforms. I believe there's a sine wave, triangular wave, advanced uh, square wave, and soft uh, square wave. Oh, okay. And, so and you're, you're oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but also uh, welding, uh, uh, there's many applications, there's many different uh, things that are be welded, many different thicknesses, many, many different alloys, and many different filler metals, and uh, uh, also personal preference, also uh, depending on the application, many welders may use, uh, if they're using a welding like a corner joint or, or a butt weld or something or a manifold, they, their, their adjustments and variables on the machine will be wide range. They'll try different uh, frequencies, uh, different um, uh, balances. They'll change the, um, the positive side and the negative side independently. They'll change the square wave, uh, or sorry, the different waveforms. So there's many variables to it. Okay. Abraham, you had a question for, for him? Uh, what wave would you be using? Pardon? What wave? Square wave, triangle wave? Uh, right now I just have it on advanced. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, foot pedal. You yep. recommend foot pedal? Uh, foot, or, yep. or, yeah. uh, foot pedal does help because uh, right now we have uh, um, high frequency an arc, essentially uh, because uh, aluminum melts a very, I believe, I believe the melting temperature is like 660 years. It's, it's something really, really low. It's but really quick, right? yeah, so. but um, uh, you want to initiate an arc without tongue touching the material here. And also when you break the arc, you want to protect the, uh, the, the tungsten itself. Uh, away from the atmosphere because what happens is when the tungsten oxidizes, you know, it'll turn blue and everything. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, and because uh, aluminum is at high temperatures quite often, depending on how hot the material is, depending on the thickness of the material that you're welding, um, it may be at high, high temperatures. And when you break the air, you want to hold the tungsten over, over the material because you're protecting the tungsten. And um, usually when it goes silver, you can count for another eight seconds and you can turn the gas off. But if you turn the gas off when, it's, when it turns silver, then it go light straw color because the temperature that the tungsten's at is going to interact with the atmosphere and go light straw or yellow. But um, if, you, if the tungsten's blue or, or purple, whatever, uh, it's very easy, very brittle, so you can easily break it off. Where when it turns silver and is protected away from the atmosphere, it's very difficult to break. Okay, okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, so essentially, uh, when it comes to the routine, because this metal, uh, um, one of the things that a welder finds when it comes to different individual metals is that different metals have a certain routine. Uh, like, for example, when you're, when you're welding titanium, uh, you'll, you'll do the welding, and then you allow the material to cool, whether it's cooled by air or allow it to cool in the presence of the atmosphere. 
and then, then you'll form the cleaning, or sorry, you'll form the, the prep work, and then you'll perform the cleaning, and then the welding. But when it comes to uh, the routine for aluminum, uh, because I'm going to be heating the material up, I'm going to clean the, the I'm first going to clean the filament metal because the, the filament metal is exposed to the atmosphere and it's not heated up or nothing, so it's not going to rapidly form lock sizes at the moment. Uh, but basically, I'm, I'm going to take the uh, the filament metal. I'm going to clean the filament metal with uh, gas and antifreeze. I could use gas and antifreeze, acetone. The filament is going to be clean first. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up the pipe. Now, when I heat up the pipe, the problem with, with aluminum is that the hotter I get it to, it starts rapidly forming oxides very, very, very fast. So it's going to, it, when I heat it up to, to help try and weld it, it's going to rapidly form oxides. And that's one of the biggest problems with aluminum is the rapid formation of oxides that protect the material. But it's going to form oxides rapidly. Uh, and immediately I'm going to brush the oxides off in the weld zone and the heat effect zone. I'm going to brush those oxides off in one direction. And I'm going to go, I'm going to attempt the weld uh, but that's after it's been heated up and, and the other thing with aluminum is that it, it, it takes the heat, you could heat up something to say 400 degrees Fahrenheit and you can start welding on it, you get a full uh, uh, length of welding electrode in there and you can check with the temple stick and the heat's gone already, it's, it's already under 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it pulls the heat away depending on the thickness of the material. But, um, yeah, and then uh, after it's welded you'll protect the tungsten away from the atmosphere and then you can, you can either allow it to cool, well actually sorry, no, no, no. No, uh, you'll, you'll protect the tungsten and then you'll uh, prep with uh, woodworking tools, you'll prep the material and then you'll, you'll clean the filler metal and then heat it up again. Yeah. So it's, it's certain steps. It's a little time consuming, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. time consuming. But it's worth it because you want to make sure you're doing it the right way. Yeah. The right way. Um, Alrighty Travis, we covered that, the routine now. What is this down here on the board that okay. you have? Uh, basically down here, uh, this is uh, certain mm -hmm. things to keep in, in mind while you're welding. This is just for the roof hat. But the reason why I'm putting out so many different numbers is because when you reflect back to, uh, say, neuro linguistics program, when you read those books, and they're not particularly welding books, but uh, they're they're uh, uh, teaching a person how to learn and how to be more observant. And in the book, it talks about the modes of, of learning. So you'd have unconscious incompetence. So if you're a welding student, and you uh, basically you'd be incompetent to doing something, but you'd be it'd be un unconscious. So you would be incompetent, and you wouldn't know that you don't know how to do something. Then you would have conscious incompetence which would be, you would, you would know that you don't know how to do something. And then you have conscious competence, which that you have an idea how to do something and you're relatively competent at it. And then your unconscious competence, which that you could do something second nature. Also in neurolinguistics, it, it talks about uh, uh, that the conscious mind is able to do uh, about, it's able to uh, control and think of seven plus two minus two uh, uh, different things at a time. So how this comes into play right here is that when you're doing the rule pass, these are the things I'm having to think about, and uh, basically a person who's even conscious and confident is still going to uh, mess a lot of these things up, and relatively when you're well aluminum, you have to be conscious confidence or unconscious confidence, but you still have to think about it. Uh, basically, the first thing first is that you're going to hold the torch perpendicular, and the reason why you hold the torch perpendicular, and this is something that Jerry at Jerry College of Welding has always explained to me, and about the importance of uh, welding and the, and the uh, creation of oxides. Uh, Basically, if this is my weld puddle right here, okay, that's my weld puddle right there. If I hold the torch perpendicular, uh, the ID of my SIG torch, for example, is going to protect uh, not only the weld puddle, but also the heat affected zone of that particular weld puddle. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to uh, um, start forming oxides ahead of the arc. It's just going to, I'm going to form a weld puddle and everything is going to be protected of that weld puddle. And that's how you can get away with welding titanium. Uh, creating a weld puddle and, and holding the torch perpendicular, and you can protect each individual ripple, and you can you can uh, deposit the metal with uh, and protect all deposit metal away from the atmosphere without having to use the trailing shells. But when it comes to aluminum, you want to hold everything perpendicular because you do not want to form any oxides ahead of the arc. Mm -hmm. And when you start uh, adding an inclination, say five degrees, ten degrees, or even walking the cup or something, and a lot of, a lot of times uh, when guys are moving from different metals, carbon stainless etc. A lot of times they start uh, uh, out of habit, uh, they start holding the torch a little bit of an angle and it goes, the weld puddle ends up going from round to slightly oblong and the torch is down here and what you're actually doing is not only you're protecting the, the puddle down here but you're also heating up the leading edge because mm -hmm. the weld puddle is going oblong. You're heating up ahead of the arc um, uh, and it's, it's starting to form oxide. So when, when you when you have an oblong well puddle and, and you, you start, uh, you have the formation and creation of oxides and you start welding over those oxides and those oxides, because they melt at 300 degrees Fahrenheit and they melt at higher density temperature than the base drill, uh, they end up as uh, porosity in your well zone. Mm -hmm. so, 
Now, when it comes to perpendicular, essentially what I'm talking about is if you have a, a 90 degree uh, carpenter square, perpendicular is straight up and down. So if this is my pipe, it's straight up and down. So any deposit, the weld ripple, uh, weld puddle here is going to protect away from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about uh, uh, adding an angle, it's, it's holding a, even a five degree, 10 degree angle, mm -hmm. and you're making the weld puddle go uh, oblong and all the arc, uh, the ox, uh, the metal ahead of the arc is going to start oxidizing. So when you're welding up to that, uh, you're going to be welding over oxide. Mm, okay, okay. Makes yeah. sense, makes sense. So that takes care of the old torch perpendicular. Now the next thing is the main chain 116 fuel. And this is actually something that, um, that uh, uh, when I was at uh, GRB College of Welding before I came here, I was there on the 27th and 28th, practicing with titanium and aluminum. And I always go to Jerry just uh just to make sure that I'm, I'm good enough to do these metals all the time because I, I always look to him to, to help me with getting to, to better myself. But um, in, in, in our conversation, he was mentioned to me about the 16th, always maintain about a, a, a penetration. So if this is my, um, if this is my belt here, you want to have at least a form of, of 1 16th that is chewing away into the parent material or freezing deposit pass it's going to be chewing it away. So essentially, every time I open the keyhole, because that's what I'm going to be doing on here, is I'm going to be opening keyhole. My my torch is going to be on the leading edge. I'm going to be opening a keyhole, and I'm I have to maintain that it, it melts one bevel tip one sixteenth at least one sixteenth, and it melts the bottom or the side uh, bevel tip one sixteenth, and then I can dive into it. Unfortunately, if if I do not do that, if one if it's less than 16th, then there's a chance that uh, when I dab into the fill metal, the root pass might not even even go in there. Okay. The other thing here is uh, dabbing into the middle of the hottest points in the puddle. So when I create the well puddle, I'll see it very glossy, clean, uh, shiny, and clear. And I have to dab into the hottest point, but I also be very conscientious of uh, the influence of gravity, uh, depending on whether it's a 2G, a 5G, or a 6G. Uh, gravity influences the, uh, the the pipe very differently. So depending on, on, on the, uh, the position of the pipe, I have to dab either, if it's say, say for example, if it's a 2G, I have to always add fill metal to the uppermost portion of the pipe and gravity pulls it down. Exactly. And even on a fill pass, otherwise it, it ends up as a, a bell shape. So if this is my, my weld here, and I have to add fill metal at the top and it'll come out, gravity will pull down uniform. Otherwise, if I add fill metal to the bottom, it comes out like a bell. Yes, exactly. exactly. So that takes care of dabbing uh, uh, into the middle of the hot point. And these are the things the person has to be consciously aware and thinking about. And these are the things that uh, the conscious mind can do seven, two plus two, minus three things at a time. Uh, keep the tip of the fill metal within the sealing gas envelope. So also in aluminum and titanium and other metals, and that's why a lot of welders, they have a lot of difficulty with these particular metals is because you, ha you have to avoid, avoid the formation of oxides in general, especially uh, uh, titanium. Uh, you have to avoid the, uh, the formation of oxides and um, uh, basically uh, uh, you have to keep the tip of the fill metal always enclosed within the shielding gas and uh, of the torch and when it comes to uh, uh, adding fill metal you're going to be uh, doing an up and downward motion so you're, all, you're on the leading edge or in the middle of the puddle but it's always an up and down motion and that way you're always uh, protected within the uh, shielding gas um, the, within the ceramic cup, the, the, the atmosphere of the ceramic cup. Uh, some guys, you can watch them, they, they may pull away uh, rather than up and down, it's pull away. So they're, they're removing the tip of the fill metal away from the, uh, uh, the, the shielding gas there of the ceramic cup. So it oxidizes the tip of the fill metal and then you, you're reintroducing oxides into the parent material, or, or sorry, into your well puddle and you're going to get oxide. Okay. I'll take care of that. Um, from, oh, the other thing with aluminum is that you have to be Aluminum is the unfortunate metal that you cannot touch with your tungsten because uh, you can you can get away with say if you're welding stainless steel or something or carbon chrome you can accidentally touch the tungsten it's not a huge deal as long as it doesn't get a tungsten inclusion mm -hmm. but you can touch it oops okay and then you can keep on welding but on lumi uh, on aluminum unfortunately if you even touch the tungsten sometimes if your tungsten gets very close you'll kind of hear the machine buzz a little bit differently. Yeah. But the second it touches, it, it makes like a huge little micro explosion and you get black soot everywhere and it just contaminates the tungsten, contaminates the weld zone and it embeds, uh, you, you can embed tungsten into the material. It, it contaminates your, 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 the aluminum contaminates the tungsten as well. Mm -hmm. 
so everything is basically contaminated. That that metal has to be removed uh, with uh, woodworking tools, a wood router, or a file, because uh, you will when you file it, you will find embed tungsten into the uh, aluminum material. Wow. So you got to be super cautious. Oh, it's terrible. Super cautious. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. But that's why these are, these are things that a person has to consciously be aware of, and that's when it comes to conscious competence or unconscious competence, mm -hmm. is that hopefully when you get to a point where you do sub, something subconsciously um, or second nature that you don't have to think of this stuff. You can think about other stuff like what you're going to do after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, but um, these are things that a person has to consciously aware of. The detector that it tungsten away from the atmosphere that's already been covered, stab up and down has been covered. And then uh, with gravity, it's been covered. But also, when it comes to these metals, um, usually when it comes to all forms of welding, uh, you 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 can do you can be invested into something for about a week, say, or a month. You you're on a job for a long duration. Uh, a lot of these things become uh, you could end up where a lot of the things you do are, are second nature. And then, say, you take a month off or two weeks off. Uh, a lot of the things that you're doing, uh, you become complacent. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you take a month off or some time off, and then you come back to the metal, and it's almost like you're relearning how to do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, because um, uh, originally when you became complacent, now you're more consciously aware of what to look for, and you're paying more more observant, and you actually end up learning, and uh, you end up observing new things that you have not seen uh, previously. So when it comes to practicing, it's almost rather than uh, keep practicing the same thing over and over and over again, hoping that you get it, it is actually, it, it's better if you practice something and then you, you take time off and then you come back to it because you will be more aware and more observant mm -hmm. uh, and right. you'll learn new things that way, taking time off than you would if you were constantly practicing something. Interesting, interesting. I did not know that, but now Travis. Neurolinguistics. Neurolinguistics. Mm -hmm. So me, my, my personal thing was, you know, to practice, you know, every day to become second nature because muscle memory for you, but that totally makes sense because there is times that when I am welding and I take a week off and I come back, I learn something different. I learn something. I'm more focused than I was when I was a week ago. And I see these things. I see more clear the puddle and everything. I'm like, oh, that's different. I haven't seen that the last time. So that's 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 really that that's something that shocked me right now. I learned something right there. So that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Um, anything else, Travis? Yeah. So essentially, the the things that we're doing in this welding video. They're just a, a, just a demonstration. They're just a, a demonstration to give uh, the viewer an idea, uh, almost like an introductory of, of different materials that you're welding, uh, titanium and aluminum. Uh, they're also, uh, uh, they, this video allows the viewer that it may, this welding may be something that may interest them. And uh, because a lot of the information, this is just uh, ideas that are given to the viewer. Uh, they themselves, they may find this uh, particular welding uh, interesting and they may uh, look for a uh, welder testing and training facility to learn how to do these things. So this is essentially in this video is just a, a demonstration. Okay. Um, so essentially we have uh, South Coast Welding Academy that will be doing the aluminum welding uh, in the course here. <laughs> yeah, so if you're in the States or well, around the States here, there's South Coast Welding Academy. Uh, the place that I've gone to that I've, uh, I've been going there since November 2008 is uh, GRB College of Welding in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I always talk with uh, Jerry, especially the life and death questions. The most critical questions, I always go and see Jerry. And the other thing is when it comes to, uh, to uh, practice, um, the way I always think about it is that uh, you learn something, you, you do a welding course and you learn something, uh, but I, I personally buy the material, I buy the pipe, I buy the machines, I buy all the tools and I start practicing a lot of these things at home. And then I get to a point where I, 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 I have a lot of unanswered questions and I, there's a lot of things I need to know that I don't know and I don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so I go back, uh, I formulate what questions I, I need to ask and I go back to GRB College of Welding and I ask Jerry these specific questions. They're more detailed, more critical questions. He gives me uh, these new answers, these new techniques, these new ideas and I go home back again and then essentially I, I level up again but it all comes with with uh, practicing first taking a course learning how to do the introductory of, of aluminum or titanium and then practicing on my own coming up with questions that I need to ask things I need to know going back to the training facility in my case is Jerry Jerry at GB College of Welding uh, once I, I take what he gives me uh, I go back home again and essentially you always level up so you always need to find somebody that um, that knows these materials inside and out 
and I've asked very, very difficult questions, uh, very intricate questions that uh, I've never been able to stump him. And, and I don't mean that, uh, I don't mean to do that intentionally. It's just that the questions I ask are extremely particular and very in-depth. And he has always been able to give me an answer and he's always been able to demonstrate it on a drawing board, uh, show me in person, show me through books. He's always had an answer for everything. So I've always been very fortunate to have uh, Jerry at GRB College of Welding to always show me how to do these things and always get me to the next, next level. Nice, 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 nice. So it's always good to give back, regardless of how many years of experience you have, and welding, whatever the case may be, this is what we're here for, is to give back. And Travis here, we're coming all the way from Alberta, Canada, to come here and teach us, teach this uh, to us, aluminum and titanium, because um, me and, and Abraham, you know, we're not perfect by no means, we're still learning every single day, and I want everybody to know that. Uh, even Travis himself, you know, he's still learning every single day. When I look at him, I'm like, this guy knows it all already, right? But he's still learning every single day. He still has questions, we're all human. So this is awesome, uh, Travis, I appreciate you. So is there anything else that you need to tell the viewers, or do you wanna just go straight to it and just go out, spit up, and just start, start going? Uh, well, when it comes to these different metals, uh, like I was saying before, you have to consider yourself as a psychologist. You're dealing with mm -hmm. these, all these different metals or you're, all your crazy patients. Yeah. They all have these quirks and personalities and you have to interact with them and figure out how to, how to deal with them. Uh, like titanium is nice that so you have the couple shooting. The titanium is very cause and effect and it, it kind of gives you an idea and it tells you what's going on. Uh, aluminum is, is difficult. Aluminum, there's things that this bottle does that I, I may follow a certain routine. That it's clean and it's washed down and it's mm -hmm. antiseptic and everything. And the material still does something that I just don't know. <laughs> why. There's, He's like, there's nope. so many variables with these metals. Yeah. So many things to consider. And also the, the purge quality and the formation of oxides from the titanium video and parts per million also re equate to aluminum as well because as you heat up aluminum, it rapidly forms oxides. Mm. And um, um, with uh, uh, lesser parts per million of oxygen, le lesser oxygen in the uh, uh, in the uh, atmosphere that is on the aluminum, lesser lesser thickness of oxides and nanometers that you're going to form. But the the other thing with aluminum is that it does not form uh, heat tint uh, like it would for stainless steel. In the sense that you know it's not going to have light straw, yellow, uh, blues, purples. It's going to be silver. It's going to be shiny, shiny version of titanium. And it's very di just do not weld over the shiny silver. So, so, so like I said, like if you don't know what parts uh, uh, per minute, correct? Parts, parts, parts per million. million. Parts no. per million. Yeah. Parts per million. There you go. Parts per million. If you don't know uh, about that, you can go to Titanium Tutorial, which is our last tutorial, and you can check that out. He goes into strict detail on that. So. Um, oh, actually, the last thing. Yes. Also, when it comes, also when it comes to aluminum, um, aluminum, it's it's a very difficult weld. I've gone into Jirby and I've I've booked my own weld test to make sure that I could still do it and I've had it where I've done everything I could and I've still broken the uh, snap, my bend coupons like a twig. Um, uh, because the oxide melts at 3700 degrees Fahrenheit and because uh, the material underneath the oxide melts at 1220 and these are numbers, you get n different numbers in different publications, essentially you have to be very conscious and careful, do not weld over the oxide because the weld puddle is not going to melt the oxide, it's not going to remove the oxide and basically what happens and I'll, I'll give it a little example here. Uh, a couple years ago, I was on a job site and I was welding 10 inch aluminum piping. And the foreman, uh, this is something that Jerry had always explained to me is that if you, you are the welder, you are the expert in a lot of these companies, they, they see uh, aluminum as shiny and um, lightweight. And that's all they know. So while I was doing this welding, it was taking me a little while to do the welding because there's certain steps I had to do in order, in order to successfully weld this material. Uh, the foreman was very um, uh, frustrated with me because I was taking a long time and I was doing everything in steps and everything. I was very particular and he wanted this material to gum together because this particular application was not going to be x-rayed. It was just going to have plastic pellets flowing through it. But the problem with that, and I explained it to him, but it kind of went over his head, is that um, I explained to him that the oxide melts at 3700 Fahrenheit, the material underneath the oxide melts at 12, 2, or 1220, and because my weld puddle does not remove the oxides, I cannot w just gum it together, I cannot weld over the oxides, I just cannot weld, just keep welding because 
because the well puddle does not burn out the oxides. The oxides just fuse and mix in with the well puddle, mm. and they'll always be there. And uh, uh, in the application where it's vibrating, and even if you go through a, a nick break test, um, eventually it's just going to crack because that's, there's no integrity in the well puddle. Mm. There's because the oxides, and this is the thing that separates uh, um, uh, aluminum separates from other metals, is, is that you just the oxides melt at such a high temperature they always have to be removed. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. So uh, it went over his head, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, but, you know, sometimes you just got to do it the right way. It's always good to do it the right way. Don't try to skip it. You know, like Travis said, the welder knows. Uh, we're the experts at this, and sometimes the people that are higher or whatever the case may be don't really know. They just look at the metal and see that it can be welded together and just keep going production-wise. But yeah. they also, because they're not familiar with the different metals, exactly. they automatically assume that every individual metal welds identical to one another. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, so... Alrighty, Travis. Uh, anything else? No. Nope. That's it? Alrighty. Alrighty, so, guys, we're gonna go ahead and tack it up. It's gonna be in the 6G position, and Travis is gonna take it from there. I appreciate y'all. Peace. Okay, so basically when it comes to feeding, uh, you have to be very precise when you open the keyhole and you add film out to the, to, to the material here. So I'm going to hold the uh, TIG torch perpendicular, but I'm going to have a pad because this material is going to be at 250 degrees Fahrenheit uh, when I do the root pass. And I'm going to heat up to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit when I do the rest of the passes. It just helps with the, the flow and the puddle and break down the material that I'm welding on, removal of the oxides. But essentially I can feed it. You have to consider how a person feeds, so there's different ways you could you could just kind of roll it a little bit. You could feed it like like this. So I'll hold it like that. You could feed it that way. You could feed it that way. You could feed it that way. You could just ro roll the fingers a little bit and feed it that way. You could hold it like a syringe and feed it that way. But essentially, on this aluminum, just What's going to happen in, is I'm going to have my hands at a V formation, so it's, it's like a V. The torch is, my fingers are going to be resting against the pipe, and the TIG torch, as I progress around the pipe, will always be perpendicular to the pipe. When I add the filament metal to the pipe, I'll have my fingers, the torch, or the, uh, the filament metal between these two fingers, and my thumb will always be moving the filament metal, and, and I'm holding it this particular way just so it stabilizes the filament metal when I add it. When I open the keyhole, I have all the time in the world to add filament metal. So if the if the pipe wants me to add filament metal and it's hot and it keeps it wants me to go faster, I don't have to. I just hold the keyhole and I can add any time I want. So I can adjust the the arc and everything until I'm ready to add filament metal. So essentially, that's just how I'm going to do it. And when I progress around the pipe, I'm going to be sliding on this heat pad here so I don't scald my fingers here. Now um, I have a question. Uh, something to say uh, for people to I know sometimes it's hard for people to keep that uh, torch perpendicular a good indication is you got to pay attention to your keyhole right oh yeah if you have a nice circular keyhole that means you're uh, you're holding the torch perpendicular if your keyhole starts getting oval shape that's an indication you got to fix your t torch position yeah but also that uh, uh, if you're holding a torch uh if you're holding the torch at an angle, say, say it's not perpendicular, but say you're holding it at an angle, when you start adding the fill metal close to the, uh, the well puddle, your, your tip of the fill metal is going to ball up, it's going to oxidize very badly, and it's going to droop down. Okay. Yeah, this is very oxidized, very rough metal. There's two things you can watch out for to see if, you, to see if you're actually uh, holding that torch perpendicular. Yeah, but essentially the biggest thing here is that um, uh, for when welding aluminum, when you open the keyhole, you have all the time in the world you want to add the fill metal. And you have to be conscientious of how you add the fill metal, because you, you can't dab it at the side. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm coming at the side, you have to be more at an angle okay. and dab it more at a stream angle and dab. Yeah. dab. And then when you dab it, it's not dab and pull away, dab and pull away, it's dab and lift upward so that it's always protected away from, uh, protected uh -huh. within the uh, inert gas. Because if, if, if it's dabbed like this, it's good. If it's dabbed like this, then it removes it away from the atmosphere. Nice, man. Nice. Uh, interesting. Yeah, Very that's interesting. That's going to help out a lot of people. Help out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> nice, 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 Travis. All right, now this is another thing that uh, Jerry at Jerry B College of Welding had taught me, was uh, welding uh, stainless uh, nickel alloys, duplex, super duplex, titanium, aluminum, particularly aluminum, is that uh, I have the tape right here. The tape is going to go on like this, 
what I have here is I have uh, uh, three layers of one side of the tape and then I have two layers of the back side so the tape has been reversed and stuck to the back side so essentially the non-sticky side of the tape is going to go against the weld zone. And basically the reason why that is because when I heat up the tape, I do not want any of this tape residue in my, my weld zone and also heat effect zone and even uh, anywhere relatively uh, close to the weld zone. And the re reason being is because if, if there's any tape residue, when I start brushing the weld zone and the heat effect zone, I do not want uh, to remove oxides. I do not want tape res residue brought into my weld zone, especially if tape residue contaminates my hand brush, which, which ends up into my weld zone. Um, Typically, you, you clean the material with gas and antifreeze, you'll clean the fill metal, you clean the pipe and everything with gas and antifreeze. But when it comes to tape residue, I found that the easiest way to remove tape residue um, and most uh, efficient way seems to be rubbing alcohol, even though it is flammable. Uh, rubbing alcohol does remove tape residue away from the heat effect zone, and that is part of uh, uh, prepping the uh, area for welding. Okay, so essentially we just uh, preheated the pipe up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit and the reason why I went with 250 Fahrenheit is because, it's, well, it's, it's hot but it's not going to scold my hands or nothing. Uh, so essentially I'm brushing the oxides off and the oxides do remove a lot easier when the material is hot but it's still, even though at this temperature it's rapidly forming the oxides really quickly. Essentially if you look at the, uh, at the pipe here, uh, you'll be able to tell exactly where I brushed, the, mostly down here. Oxides are coming off now. Same with over here. Now even though this is taped, I'm gonna put a piece of tape right here because my there's a good chance that my hand might come up and peel this back. Some I don't want, so I'm gonna put this tape on there. Now when my hand slides on, it's not going to interact with the tape and feel it back.
So essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just removing the attack with the uh, file and as you can see even with slow movements it does contaminate the file and uh, going in this direction it also has uh, um, aluminum particles that fall into the pipe which not necessarily you really don't want. But once the attack is gone I can and you want a new new uh, file so once that's gone I can pry the the uh, tack out and then there's all oxi oxides underneath the tack so those I gotta clean and then once those are clean then I start working on the uh, on the um, all the starts and stops so I have a nice start there I was done with the file just going in this direction it's all done with the file and then the uh, the tie-in at the end here that will need to be filed so I'll file that and have a nice really nice ramp 